you to open up your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 12. As we finish chapter 12 today, as we head towards the final chapter, much better things. I don't know if you've ever considered who you are in Christ and how much different that actually is than what the children of Israel experienced under the law. But the differences are staggering. Fear to faith, law to grace. In essence, the work of the flesh and the work of the spirit. We are children of God by grace through faith. We live in a world of much better things. To join me, we'll pick up in verse 22. We're going to pray, and very specifically for what's going on in Mayfield, Kentucky, and the tornado that touched down that destroyed that city almost in its entirety. Father, we lift up those who are suffering right now through this incredible destruction that occurred through these tornadoes that swept through the region a couple of days ago. And Lord, we pray specifically for the city of Mayfield and Lord, for those that have lost loved ones and their homes, their livelihood. Lord, the Christmas that they're looking at is going to seem pretty bleak. And so we pray that you would impress upon our hearts uh, what we can do in a practical way to come alongside, Lord, as we have sent some people to see what we can do. We ask that you would bring back a report that we would be able to step into that place of pain and perhaps bring a little hope. And so, Lord, we give you our time today that our ears would be attentive to the Spirit's voice Use your word to instruct your church. Bless us, we pray, as we study in Jesus' name. Amen. Much better things. You no longer have to be frightened of God. You're no longer standing at the mount called Sinai, this trembling place. But you're standing at Zion, gazing at the grace-filled eyes of the Savior, but you have not come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly, the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all and to the spirits of just men made perfect. But you have come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, to the blood of the sprinkling that speaks of better things than that of Abel. Cain and Abel understood that God expected of them sacrifices. And even those sacrifices were fought over, ultimately ending in the world's first murder. We haven't come to that place. We're, we're no longer dwelling at the base of Sinai, we, we are dwelling in Zion. We have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God. The place where God himself sacrificed for us that we might have a relationship with him. We're no longer under the law, but under grace. We've reached out to the one and only King of Kings and Lord of Lords, not by law keeping, but by surrender, giving up our own lives in service of him. And verse 25 is so important to the context here. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. God is speaking to us. God now speaks to us through his son, through the word of God. He's no longer shouting from the top of Mount Sinai. He's no longer laid a burden upon us. He's lifted that burden by grace. It does not mean that his holy standards have changed one iota. 
It doesn't mean that he's less than holy. It does not mean that we can sin with impunity. It doesn't mean that we can do things our own way. It means that we now can come to Zion's hill. That God receives all those who call upon his name. That you've been saved by grace and through faith. It is not of works. You can't boast about it. Because we're now saved by grace and we now have that relationship with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, we have better things available to us. I shudder to think how I would have endured living under the law myself. Matter of fact, I can tell you when I tried to do that before I came to faith in Christ, when I tried to be well-pleasing to God, I fell miserably short. And I tried. There was a period of time in my life when I was a, probably 11 to 13 years old, I figured, you know what, I'm just going to try and be godly. Can I tell you in my flesh that didn't work so well? I didn't just fall short of the glory of God. I fell really short of the glory of God. For if they did not escape who refused him, who spoke on earth, again, these two mountains are very visible in this passage. We ended last week with Sinai. We're now at Zion's hill. God spoke literally, quite literally. Matter of fact, he spoke so strongly that it was engraved in stone to Moses. Moses comes down the mountain with a couple of tablets etched with the very finger of God. Here's the ten things I expect of you. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, how much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven? You see, the picture here is that If God held accountable the Jewish people under the law when God physically spoke from Mount Sinai, what do you think he's going to do to those who refuse him when he's spoken to us with the very blood of his own son on Zion's hill? To reject the grace of God is to reject the only plan that God has for salvation. There isn't another one. There's not an alternate path. There isn't, well, if you want to keep the law, keep the law. And if you want to be in grace, be in grace. There is salvation by grace through faith, and there is no other way. Jesus is the way, and he is the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by him, exactly as John 14, 6 declares to us. There's not an alternate path to the grace of God. If you reject the grace of God, you are literally rejecting the only way to come into God's presence. Whose voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, yet once more, I shall not only shake the earth, but also heaven. And now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things which are being shaken. As of the things that are made. That the things which cannot be shaken may remain. And therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. You realize, church, your kingdom in heaven can't be shaken. It's out of the reach of politics. It's out of the reach of war. It's out of the reach of our humanity. It's out of the reach of climate change. It's out of the reach of budgets. It's out of the reach of everything. It is in heaven. It cannot be shaken. That's the kingdom we look forward to. As wonderful as some things are here on earth, not everything here on earth is wonderful. 
nor is it universally good to all people. And because God hates inequity, he has a plan to settle all these things once and for all. This earth and everything on it one day will be rolled up like a scroll. It will not continue forever for all of our best hopes to change the direction that our climate is going or to change the political outlook of the world globally, to come to some solutions that might more best benefit most people, we will not actually ever accomplish that goal because God never intended for this planet to be the end result. He has always planned for his kingdom to come and his will to be done. And one day, this earth is going to be finished, done. And his kingdom, the fullness of it, will come. The Bible is very clear on this. The Bible is very clear on this. We're receiving that kingdom which cannot be shaken by grace. Notice, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. God's character, God's nature, God's standards have not changed with our culture. What mankind attempts to report to be God's new plan is Satan's old plan. God hasn't given up on marriage. Society's given up on marriage. God hasn't said that there's multiple genders. Society has said there's multiple genders. God hasn't given up on peace. Society has largely given up on peace. This earth is not our home. God intends to redeem all things and to bring to pass his kingdom. He has planned for his people much better things. Because we are under grace today, instead of dwelling there at the base of Mount Sinai, we dwell at Zion's hill. Those two mountains mentioned in Scripture are extremely significant in Israel's history. And if you remember that Mount Sinai was, was a place that for the people of Israel, they, li- they dwelled in fear. They literally trembled at the base of the mountain. They were scared to even touch it or touch an animal that had been on it. It's like, there's God, here's us, and we're not going anywhere near him. That wasn't what God wanted. God has always desired to be near his people. The problem is our sin separates us from God. Our lack of holiness in our lives always separates us from God. And because man was incapable of transforming himself, God sends Jesus into the world to save us from ourselves, to present grace to us so that we can now have a relationship with God so that he can be near us because we have to have our sins forgiven. You keep your sin, you don't get God. It's a package deal. You have to be sinless to be in the presence of the Lord. And the only way for that to happen is to have all of your sins, 100% of them, forgiven. Amen? Amen. You you can't keep them. You you don't get to be like 97% okay with God. You have to be 100% okay. You have to have all of your sin forgiven. You can't do that with your own sacrifice. You can't do that with your own work. You will never be good enough by yourself. No matter how hard you try, no matter how many times you attempt to march to the top of Sinai, you are going to need Zion to get there. 
You're going to have to go to Zion's Hill at some point in time. Mount Zion was the center of Israel's worship in the Old Testament. The ninth psalm reminds us, sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare his deeds amongst the people. There was a visible representation of the Lord. Now, that wasn't his only dwelling place. You know, sometimes people get the anthropomorphic view of this picture of God dwelling between the two cherubim on the mercy seat as if that was the only place God was. That's not the case, but it was a representation that the Jewish people could look at. That's where he dwells, right over there. And even knowing where he dwelt, the children of Israel still couldn't make it happen. They still fell short of the glory of God. They had the capacity, but they lacked the will. The very same thing that Paul said, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? Those things which I will to do, I do not do. And those things which I will not to do. That's exactly what I do do. Literally. (laughs) I'm in trouble. Who will deliver me? How am I going to get out of this? What's going to happen? Read it for yourself in Romans 7. That's the great apostle Paul declaring, I'm in trouble without the grace of God. God was present in the tabernacle. He was present there in Solomon's temple. He was there in the wilderness. He was there in Jerusalem. But can we all agree that sometimes we try and hide from the presence of the Lord? Somehow we think we can you know, shade God's view of whatever it is that we're doing because we know what we're supposed to do, but we do it not. That's where we need to be really thankful for the grace of God that frees us from all of our unrighteousness. You see, we're so used to picking and choosing our sinful behaviors that we say are unacceptable that we forget that we've chosen some things that, as far as God is concerned, are still unacceptable to leave in our lives. That anger, the root of bitterness, the hate, the racism, the angst, the things that we can look back on and say, well, you know, I I don't know if that's sin. Well, when the Bible says it's sin, it's sin. And our justifying of it doesn't make it not sin. It remains sin. That jealousy, that envy, that strife, that gossip, that tail-bearing, that lying, that cheating, that deceiving... That coveting. You see, when you start to throw those things in, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen? You see, you might do really good at a handful of things. You might be kind of, sort of good at a few other things. But I'm pretty sure there's some things when you really look at the volume of what Scripture says is not okay with God, you're going to go, nah, I need the grace of God for that. Amen? You see, when you acknowledge that you're a sinner and that you need a savior, you're putting yourself in the place of grace. But if you want to hang on to your sin and say, well, I can handle that myself, you're going to come up short when you get to heaven. When you tell God you don't need his grace to cover your sin, then you don't need the much better thing that Jesus did on the cross. You're relying on you. And that's not going to work out very well when you get there. God's got a new home. You talk about better. 
In a practical sense, the Jewish people believed it was in the temple or it was in the tabernacle. It's like there's God, we, the high priest can meet with him on Yom Kippur. He's right over there. By his marvelous plan of grace, his home is now in you. In every believer. He actually dwells in us to will and to do his good pleasure. But we're still looking for a permanent home, a new Jerusalem. We we are laying hold of today that which will be complete in the future. The easiest way to look at it is if you've never done this, perhaps you've gone to a new housing development and kind of wandered through the project as it's being built. And specifically, there's a reason that those model homes that you look at are decked out to the nines with every single option that you're not going to get in your house. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? It's like the upgraded tile, the upgraded appliances, the upgraded draperies, the upgraded landscaping, the upgraded everything. It's like when you look at it, it's like, I want that one. And then you look at the one that you can actually afford. It's like, well, can I have the, I, I want the model. Well, one day when you get to heaven, you're going to get the fully upgraded model. Amen? You're not going to get there and go, man, I'm so depressed. It's like you go over to your neighbor's house and it's like, how did you get, well, I got the model. You're all going to get the model. There is a new Jerusalem. There's a new heaven. There's a new earth. And all the things that you've suffered through in this life, every bit of injustice and indignity will be done away with. Every pain, every sorrow, every tear wiped away. What was anger and bitterness shall be turned into joy. Mourning itself will no longer exist. We look forward to that day. We are going to have a new home. Jesus purchased that home for you. Jesus has made your home a reality. And actually, he himself said, I go to work on your home, to prepare a place for you. That where I am, say it, church, you might be also, amen? So in that sense... You have the reality of it in your heart today. You kind of got to tour it by understanding who you are in Christ. One day, you're going to get the keys. You're going to open the door to that mansion and step in, figuratively speaking, of course. And there you are, in your new home. In the meantime, we get the joyous existence of thinking about that prospect. It's like, I can't wait. One day this earthly travail, the Bible says, will be over. One day the contrast between these two places will no longer need to be considered. I won't have to worry about whether I'm walking in the law anymore. Because my existence will be all grace. Everything that God wants for me. Right now, I'm still struggling to walk in his grace from time to time. Anybody else got that problem? It's like, Lord, I know what you want for me. But the old axiom, most people can mess up a good thing, is true. We're quite capable of messing up a good thing. God wants it for us, but we don't put ourselves in the best position to receive it. You have that citizenship already in Christ. Act as a citizen of heaven. What else is better? God's new all-inclusive family. Now, because in our society right now, the word inclusive or inclusion means something that the Bible isn't talking about. It doesn't mean including everything, and it certainly doesn't include, include sin. It means everyone. It means every tribe, tongue, and nation. 
It means that all who call upon the name of the Lord, both Jew and Gentile, it means every single person who has said yes to the offer of grace, we all are a member of that one family. I, I don't enter into some covenant whereby I have to do a bunch of things or participate in a number of activities. It means that by grace and through faith, I am a part of God's one family. Ephesians 4, one faith, one hope, one Lord over all, and his name is Jesus. It's going to be all-inclusive. And here's why this is important. You, you might be sitting next to somebody that you're like, well, I'm not sure I want to consider them family. Well, you better. Because when you get to heaven, you're sitting next to literally your brother and your sister. Your family. To be in Christ is to be part of the single body of Christ. It's not a bunch of bodies of Christ. There's only one. God hates division. But that family has some criteria that are visible. Every believer is a firstborn son, a firstborn daughter. We are not the firstborn, that belongs to Jesus, amen? He is the prototokos, the firstborn of all creation. He is what we cannot be, but in him, we are in that one family and part of the firstborn. We're heavenly citizens, and that includes all of us. But you know what? There's some things that mark all of us. We are supposed to be washed up, has been, sinners. God's kids are supposed to be identified by the way they live their lives. It's amazing to me how many Christians think that because grace is a free gift that you just get to live your life however you want. It's not that kind of inclusion. God's kids are also holy kids, righteous kids, kids concerned with what God's word says about life and living. Apostle Paul actually reminds us of this, both in Romans chapter 1 and very specifically in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, when he says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And he goes on to say a bunch of sinful things, thieves, covetous, drunkenness, revilers, homosexuals, fornicators, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Then he tells us why we should be concerned with that. And such were some of you, past tense. But you were washed. In other words, washed kids don't go back to the mud. Washed kids don't wallow in the pigsty. Grace kids don't delve in the very sins that we've been forgiven of. We do not return to the vomit, is what Paul actually says. We don't re-eat what made us sick in the first place. As gross as that may be to you, that's what the Bible says. We're supposed to be pure and holy and righteous as he is holy and righteous and pure. We're supposed to live our lives as best as we possibly can in righteousness. He's a holy God. So we no longer have to be afraid of the mountain, but we do have to live lives worthy of the mountain. We need to give our lives to that purpose, a living sacrifice that is holy and acceptable unto the Lord. And one of the things that you'll figure out very quickly if you travel to Washington, D.C., is there are things that are expected of you when you enter into the White House, the Capitol building. You're wearing T-shirts that say something bad about the United States of America, plan on not getting in. Not happening. Not free speech. Why? Because it's the people's house. 
you're supposed to believe that. And in a much greater way, as the children of God, God has told us what his kids are supposed to look like and how we're supposed to act. And so in that inclusion, it includes those who are godly in Christ Jesus. Living lives that are well-pleasing to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords. Now, does that mean that we're saved by doing those things? No, it does not. But it means because we are saved by grace and through faith, that our endeavor to live godly in Christ Jesus includes everything within us. All of our zeal and effort is applied to living a life that would be pleasing to the Lord who saved us. So we flee youthful lusts. We run from unrighteousness. We repent of our sin. We let go of ungodliness. When you get to heaven, you're not going to be judged for salvation, but you are going to be judged for those works that were done in this body. And hopefully, the result of that will be some reward. You see, that inclusion should make us live righteous lives. It should cause us to live in holiness. Not a popular subject in our world. I was talking with a guy last week, and you know, he's telling me, you know, he he happens to go to a church that believes that once you say the sinner's prayer, you can do anything you want. And he was he was literally naming the number of sins that they had dwelling in the church. Like, well, you know, we we don't well, we have cocktail parties after service. I said, oh, that's really great. I'm sure the devil will enjoy that. <laughs> God's people live their lives God's way. Period. Period. We are to be living examples of a living Christ. Those things which are not found in our Savior should not be found in us. Maybe you think that's hard. It is. But it's not impossible. Because by him I can do how many things? All things through Christ who strengthens me. Including resisting the temptations of the devil. Doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to be perfect. We should try, though. You know, sometimes I think the church has given up trying to be like Christ, when in fact that is our mission, that's our goal, to be like Christ and to preach the good news of the gospel until the Lord Jesus takes us home. Because the world doesn't need other examples of how not to live life. It needs examples of how to live life godly in Christ Jesus. If we do that, we're accomplishing the mission. If we do anything else, we're helping the devil deceive. Christians who walk in sin help the devil deceive other people. Because then those people believe that either God has no power over that area of sin, or that he doesn't even care that you're walking in it. Both of those things are deceptions from the enemy. So the church should endeavor to live godly in Christ Jesus. We should have better results from living in that family. You have come to Jesus, the New Living Translation says of verse 24, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people through the sprinkled blood which he graciously forgives instead of crying out for, get, for vengeance against blood as Abel did. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm really excited about the grace of God. And I am not really excited about my own blood being spilled for my sin. Which one do you want? I know what I want. In that new family, I want the blood of the new covenant to pay the price for my sin. 
Amen. So I live my life in such a way. That's how I live. It's like, Lord, I'm so excited that you forgave my sin that I don't want to give you anything else to forgive. I don't want to be that person that says, wow, I'm just a living example of God's grace. Look how much sinning I do. There are people like that. And frankly, I don't believe personally that they have much to stand on in the way of assurance that they're even saved. Maybe they are. I kind of doubt it. When the Bible says that we who have been forgiven much ought to live lives that are living sacrifices, we probably should think about doing that. So see that you do not refuse him who speaks. I don't have to offer sacrifices. I don't have to sacrifice myself. I'm no longer walking in that bondage of trying to do it myself. Christ did it for me. The least I can do is say thank you by living for him. It's like, Lord, you saved me. I'm all in. Whatever you want to do with my life from here going forward, I'm going to heaven. You just point me the right direction I'm going to go. I'm going to say yes to a sacrificed life. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, so I should be living a life that God would say, that's telling me you care. That looks a whole lot like what the Word says you should look like as a believer. This is not confusing. It shouldn't be something that we look at as like, you know, wow, I think there's another way. You either are on the grace highway or not. You're either a child of God by grace through faith or you're not a child of God. There isn't another way. If there's anything that the Bible is clear on that most people can see for their own selves, it's that God has one plan of salvation and that's through Christ Jesus our Lord. There isn't another one. Mount Sinai no longer has the capacity to be reached apart from the grace of God. You can't get to the holiness of God without the grace of God. It's that simple. You can't be forgiven without the blood of Christ. It's that simple. You're either resting in the sacrifice made for you on the cross, or you're still thinking you can somehow sacrifice enough yourself to do the job. Not going to work. To think any other way is tragic. It brings condemnation on those who even attempt. God's going to shake things up one day. He's going to shake the earth one final time. Zechariah 14 actually tells us about that shaking. It's going to be so bad that the Mount of Olives itself will be split in two. And then he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. The focus of the final two chapters of the book of Revelation. New Jerusalem, new heaven, new earth. Full righteousness, no sin. But in the meantime, we should be ushering that time in by the way we live our lives. In other words, we should be practicing holiness. Practicing righteousness. Practicing living as we will one day fully live. I'm not going to be getting there judged. I'm going to be getting there because of grace. Sometimes people say, well, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want to go to the great white throne judgment. Good, then don't. It's not for believers. It's for unbelievers. The only people who are going to stand at that judgment seat are people who have rejected the only way of salvation. When you reject the grace of God, then you're saying, I can withstand a holy God to his face and say, this is why you should let me in. And I don't care if you're Jeff Bezos, you can't buy your way in. I don't care if you're the Pope, you can't holiness your way in with practical holiness. 
The only way you're going to get in is the precious blood of the Lamb has sponged the entire debt of your sin. Christ will have paid the price for you. And as you stand in his grace before a holy God, the righteousness of the living Christ will be placed upon you so that God sees not one sin you've ever committed. You will be justified, both legally and morally. The price will be paid, and the penalty will have been put upon Jesus at the cross. Sometimes we forget the legal penalty of our sin was paid in full at the cross. You deserve to die, and Christ died in your place. The penalty that you owed was paid by him. He made justification for you. Squared the debts of your sin, past, present, and future. And all he asks is that you live for him now. That's all he asks. That's the results of being in God's family. My conscience has been cleansed. I now understand the conviction of sin. I, I look at my life and go, Lord, I know that's not what you want for me. Help me to live for you. When God shakes things up the next time, it's because the old is gone and the new has come. Now this yet once more, verse 27, indicates the removal of those things that are shaken. You see, in Christ, when that time comes, you're not going to be shaken. You won't be moved. Because only things that are fleshly and carnal, things that are not of God, things that are just simply of the creation, we could call it humanist. We could call it hedonistic. We can call it all kinds of things. Jesus himself said there in the Olivet Discourse, heaven and earth itself will pass away, but my words will by no means ever pass away. That's heaven and earth, church. That's Jesus. Peter echoed that same thing. The heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until that final day. God says enough. So the question becomes, which kingdom are you a part of? The one that will be shaken or the one that cannot ever be shaken? I see a lot of Christians in our world today shaken by the things that are going on. It's as if God's not able. Like somehow he just doesn't have enough power to handle that situation. I, I get emails constantly from people. It's like, well, you know, you should have warned us about President Biden. If God can't handle Joe Biden, we are in trouble. Okay? Just saying. If God can't handle a president of a country that represents about less than 5% of the world's population, then you shouldn't worship him. But he can. If God can't handle our economy, then we should not worship him. But he can. If God can't handle the division that exists in our country, then you shouldn't worship him. But he can. We worship the true and the living God. And he's worthy of that. Amen? That's why verse 28 says what it says. We are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. U.S. being shaken. NATO being shaken. Doesn't mean that we don't engage in the things that are necessary for life and living while we're still here, but ultimately we serve the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and look forward to a kingdom that can't be shaken. We need to keep our eyes focused on the prize, church. Do your part in the here and now. Live your life for the King in the here and now. But our kingdom is not of this world, it's still to come. 
And that kingdom that we are receiving is a grace-filled kingdom. And so those better things that we look forward to are very simple. They're attached to the things that we can be thankful for every day. So I was looking at pictures of the devastation from Mayfield. Anybody here thankful for a roof over your head? Because they don't have roofs. Whole town's gone. That tornado touched down across four states. It was on the ground for 220 miles. Sometimes we forget to thank God for a roof. Connie and I are kind of looking at our lives, thinking about downsizing, went into my closet, and I'm thinking to myself, that went out in the 80s. What do we need that for? I, if, if I started wearing all the clothes in my closet, I could wear something new every day and look dumb every day. How about clean water? You open your tap, you know what comes out? Drinkable water that won't poison and kill you. Pretty good chunk of the world doesn't have that. A bed. Food. Think of simple things. And in a spiritual sense, you have peace with God the Father through Christ the Son. It's a pretty big deal. Because you didn't have that before. You were actually at war with God. And Jesus ended that war for you. Amen? For reason to be thankful. God has a plan for your life. You have a mansion. Maybe you don't have a mansion right now. Probably most of us don't have mansions. Maybe you don't like your house at all. Maybe you don't have a house. One day, you will have a mansion. One day. You have the brochure about it in your lap. You go to those model homes, they give you that nice, you know, five, it's a beautiful, it's got the cover, and you open it up, and there it is. And they always say stuff like this, this is your new home. <laughs> You're going like, I ain't never getting that, bro. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Jesus is not offering you something you can't have. He's offering something that you will get. It's a promise. I go to prepare a place for you. You can be thankful for that. You can be thankful that you now have an ability to live a life that's well-pleasing to God the Father through Christ the Son. Because of his grace, grace for your failures, I might add. Grace for your rebellious moments, I might add. Grace that's sufficient for all your sin, I might add. Grace that covers your weaknesses, I might add. You can be thankful for that. Instead of the road to perdition, you're on the road to glory. Be thankful for that. Thank God for everything. Just be thankful. Live a life of thankfulness. Because one day when this journey's over, you aren't even going to remember what it was to, to be here. You're going to be so enraptured with the glorious wonders of heaven that you're going to go, uh, what were those 60, 70, 80, 100 years? But a vapor, exactly as James said. But eternity's forever. His kingdom is forever. His glory is forever. So let's be thankful. Amen? Would you stand? We'll close in prayer. If you've never invited Jesus into your life, you need to do that. Because that's the first step on the road to glory. i going to encourage you to go straight to our prayer room after service and say, what do I need to do? 
pray. Just invite him. Say, Lord, I'm a, I'm a sinner. I recognize that. And I want to be part of your kingdom to come. He will come in and sup with you. And he will save you. But you've got to ask. For the rest of us, let's live lives worthy of the king and his kingdom. Father, we thank you for the power of the Spirit to transform our lives. Lord, I thank you for the forgiveness of my sin. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you for the sacrifice of the cross. It was at such a great cost, Lord. The weight of my sin was placed upon you. Collective sins of the world heaped upon the sinless lamb, you, Jesus. We have so much to be thankful for and so much to look forward to. So many better things now await us. We could go on all day. But Lord, in gratefulness and thankfulness, we simply say to you, Lord, thank you for all that you've done and all that you will do. Seal us by your spirit. Cause us to walk with you and for you all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name.